We're going to go on to my next lecture, which is on urinary morbidity. This is my favorite lecture. I love giving this lecture because it really is a cookbook guideline on how to protect the urinary function of your patients. Okay, so the, uh, the most important thing is to recognize high-risk situations. And for urinary uh, function preservation, we need to know whether or not the patient had prior prostate surgery, does he have a large gland, does he have outlet obstruction, and what's his age at presentation, and what comorbidities comor mor are there, because they all can affect uh, the potential for having incontinence or abnormal IPSS scores down the road. So we republished this paper in 2012, uh, and I'm going to update it at the AUA. Uh, it was 1,932 patients. There were 11,500 IPSS scores in the database, an average of six per patient, and 750 got implant alone, almost 500 got implant plus hormones, and almost 700 got combination therapy. So the good news, this is the entire group of patients the baseline IPSS score before implant was 7.4, and 10 years out, it was 7.8. So in overall, there was no change in urinary quality of life. And just like uh, Dr. Hork just showed you, the patients who present in the blue uh, with the least urinary symptoms, so they're normal, 0 to 7 on the AUA symptom score, they're the ones that seem to have more problems, although it's not substantial. So the score, the at mean score or the median score at time zero was zero, and it was 2.7 points up uh, at 10 years. Whereas those group of men who presented with the worst symptoms, that's the green bar, at time zero with a score above 20, they actually lost an average of 11 points at 10 years. So they were 50% better. So the dogma, when we started, I think it's still dogma, but it's getting less, is you can't implant patients with high urinary symptom scores, which is absolutely wrong. You can, mm -hmm. because they actually, it serves almost like a terp. It, the, because the prostate shrink over time, the symptoms get substantially better. So that was good news. And not only that, what we found was that if a patient was in the lowest category of symptom score, it took them um, an average of almost 40 months to, uh, to, resolve, to resolve where, you know, at the resolution, I'm sorry, the resolution rate of two years was 39%, whereas if they presented with a score of 20 or greater, 83% of the men had resolved their symptoms. So the resolution was faster in the worst symptom scores, and the time to 50% resolution was six months versus five years uh, for the worst scores versus the better scores. So, and Richard said this the other day, patients who do get hormones seem to do a little bit better, although I don't think it's substantial. So here's the hormone patients showing their change in symptom scores, either no hormones, and you see their it tracks, there's always a little bit of a difference favoring the use of hormonal therapy. And that was significant at 10 years to 0.017. Here's dose. So, um, this is very important because we've always had the philosophy that you need to use higher doses of radiation. And when we started the program in 1990, we set out to deliver a dose of 160 gray to the prostate, the D90. That was before the TG43 formalism came in. And when it, when it came in, they said, oh, we weren't supposed to be given 160. We're really given 145. We didn't change. We just said, no, we're given 160. And over time, as the technique got better and we added the uh, software into, into it, our dose uh, for implants was 200 in gray, and I published this a number of years ago in the Journal of Urology. So 200 gray is BED, uh, it's 189 gray if it's an iodine implant for post-implant D90. And the 95% uh, confidence interval on the implants at 200 gray was three gray. So 95% of, of the implants were within three gray of 200, so 197 to two, which is amazing. But you can achieve these really consistent results. But the bottom line here is that there was no difference at 10 years in those patients who had higher dose implants versus lower dose implants uh, when you looked at 
uh, their symptom scores. So high dose does not equal worse urinary symptom scores. But there's a reason, just like there's a reason for the sexual function as why it's preserved, it's got to do with technique, there is a reason why you can get away with higher doses and not have the patient suffer worse urinary symptoms. And when you look at the multivariate analysis of all the variables, you see the dose does affect symptoms in the first year. So patients will have more symptoms uh, with higher dose in the first year. They'll have more symptoms when the prostate's larger in the first two years. And they'll have, more, they'll have less symptoms when you give you, uh, hormonal therapy in the first three years. But when you look along 10 year, down at 10 years on the bottom, nothing significant. Goes away. Now, this is a, uh, a, a, a sagittal image of a patient with a big TUR defect. A lot of people would just say, I'm not touching that. But what you don't want to do is put seeds here because this tissue, this gets to the prevention, this tissue has very poor blood supply because it's had severe cauterization during the TUR process. And if you got a really high dose of radiation, because that's what you get near the seeds, on top of that tissue, that tissue is going to slough off and that patient will end up incontinent. So you need to put the, the seeds well away from the defect. I'm only showing you one view, because you go lateral, you don't have that defect. So that's a technical problem, and these patients can be managed with seed implant as long as you're very careful not to get the seeds too close to the cavity. So this patient doesn't have any problems. Uh, this is an implant we did uh, back in 2007. I'm doing this for illustrative purposes. So uh, low-risk patient. He's got a V150 of 64%, which is a little high. So the green is the 160-gray uh, isodose curve, the reds of prostate, and the yellow islands are the V150 or the 240-gray. But we like to have this distribution, this sort of horseshoe shape that occupies about 50% of the prostate, well away from the rectum and well away from the urethra. So, but it's still a little hot. It's 64%. So I'm finishing this case, and I've put in maybe 70, 75 seeds, and i got four seeds left. Yeah, it's not a lot of seeds. It's barely 5%. And I know the patient's cancer was over in this area, so I'm just going to put four more seeds in that area because I don't want to have any left over, and it's four is not a lot of seeds. So I put the four seeds in there, and now I have this, which is confluence of the V150 covering the urethra. And now the, the V150, remember this is a 240 gray V150 because it's a 160 plane dose, is now 87%. Now, this patient is probably going to be okay. But you don't have the control over that patient's life because he'll come to see you for the implant and then he's going to go see Dr. Tom down the street who, who, and he's going to complain of a couple years down the road. He's got, oh, I got some irritation and he's going to look in and he's going to see this little bit stiff urethra. Patient doesn't really have any problems other than maybe a little irritation. He goes, I can fix that. I'll scrape that tissue out of the way. And if the patient ended up with a prior situation, Great implant, not confluence over the urethra, he'll probably be okay. But if you operate on this patient, it's a road to disaster. So it's not only what you're doing to the patient, it's the risk that that patient may go see somebody else who's not very knowledgeable. I've never seen a urologist who one of my patients went to see after brachytherapy for some type of urethral treatment call me and say, well, geez, I gotta do a TUR on this guy, I'm concerned, what's the dose to his urethra, or what's the dose to his prostate? It's never happened. And if it's not happening to me, it's not happening to anybody else. So you have to predict the potential for risk. One of the things I learned in 1990, when I, and I'm a urologist, I'm not a radiation oncologist, when I started doing this treatment is my, uh, res, my uh, attending, who's in uh, working with me at that time, was Mike Wesson, uh, said to me, radiation never goes away. The patient may look fine, but the tissues are not, especially if they got a high dose. So what do we do about big prostates? Do we have a size limitation when we do a seed implant, and does the size of the prostate affect the quality of the implant, and how do you manage an intravesical lobe? So we reported a number of years ago that if you gave combination hormone therapy, which is an antiandrogen and uh, a LHRH agonist, you got about a 33% shrinkage in gland volume by three months. So that allowed us to do most of those prostates that were bigger than 50 
by giving them three months of hormonal therapy. I, we ran a little bit, a bit of a, a trial giving the patients uh, flutamide and finasteride, so we gave them oral therapy, hoping we could preserve sexual function and take away a lot of the hot flash comp complaints, but we only got 10% shrinkage at three months, so we gave that one up. So uh, one of the issues that we run into not too infrequently is these large intravesical lobes. And it, I can't tell you how many times I've been to a hospital to train urologists, and we tell them, measure the prostate volume. That's all we need you to do. We don't need to do pre-planning, because we're doing all the planning in the OR. And we'll bring, order enough uh, seeds to manage that prostate. And I always would said 10% more, because we weren't necessarily believing the volume we got. So if it was a 30 gram gland, we would say, okay, we'll bring 33 or 35 uh, cc's worth of activity to cover that volume. But I can't tell you the number of times we get in there and we would see the situation like this where there's a huge intravesical lobe. And what the urologist had done is measure the prostate and the probe wasn't in the midline. It was just a little, a few degrees off or the bladder wasn't full. So if you don't have a full bladder or at least enough urine in there to, to be able to see the intravesical component, you can't measure the prostate in sagittal. And what's typical in the urology office is the patient comes in and the nurse says, go pee. We want to look at your urine. Then the doctor says, okay, it's time for me to do an ultrasound, and he can't see the intravesical lobe. So you got to make sure the patient has urine in his bladder because this patient was really more like this. He had a huge intravesical lobe uh, when you looked at the midline. Now, these are my pictures trying to demonstrate something, but I can tell you that situation happens way too often. Here's a patient with a prostate length of nine centimeters, 204 cubic centimeters before he got treated. Now this guy it was 75 years old. He had multifocal Gleason 8. And now maybe a lot of times you don't want to treat a 75 year old. When a patient comes with really bad disease and I think he needs to be treated, but this represented a huge challenge. Who would bother, who would try and take on the challenge of a, of a 200 gram prostate? And even if you shrunk this, it's not shrinking more than 140 or 150 cc's anyway. So this is, this is a real dilemma. And if you, this guy's got high volume disease and you decide, oh, I can't do the implant, I'm just gonna set him for 72 gray, because that was a dose in those days, and put them on two years of hormones, you're wasting your time. You are not curing that patient. So uh, I'm going to get back to him in a minute. We looked at what happens when uh, you have a patient with a very large prostate, greater than 60 versus uh, more than 60, and you look at prostates, you look at urinary symptoms uh, down the road, and it didn't matter if it was the prostate was big or the prostate was small. They all did the same. So large prostates don't predict for worse urinary symptoms. And what about doing an implant? So when we, when we started to take on the challenge of implanting big prostates, the concern was you're not going to get the seeds distributed prop, uh, properly, especially if they have pubic arch interference. Uh, and therefore, the dosimetry would be compromised. And if the dosimetry is compromised, the patient's not going to be cured. So you're wasting your time doing this. The implant. So we published this in 2000, and what we found is that and this is early experience. In the 66 patients that have prostate volume more than 50 cubic centimeters, it was only one that had a D90 less than 140, and the median D90 was actually 188 gray. So that's in line what we want to deliver to our patients. So we didn't feel that we were compromising our patients by implanting them if they had very large prostates in terms of the dosimetry. So the next question is, what are we really doing? If the patient's prostate volume are going to shrink anyway, and they do, whether they get hormones, they shrink faster in a shorter period of time. But when you look at them 10 years later, it didn't matter if they got hormones. They're, they're exactly the same. They are, have shrunk the same percent. So by 10 years out, the average shrinkage is 50%. So a 60-year-old become 30 and 70 will become 35. They're the same degree of shrinkage whether they got hormones or not. So that doesn't benefit patients. So what, did, what are we trying to achieve when we give hormonal therapy? Well, maybe we can reduce retention rate. And we looked at these patients who uh, uh, got hormonal therapy. 
the urinary retention rate, now these are all the big glands, was 10%. So it's a bit higher, a little bit higher than with a, without a large prostate. And we did see, again, these are all big prostates, more than 50. We did see that uh, patients who got hormonal therapy had a little bit less rise in their AUE symptom score from 9 to 12. And when you follow them out for, this is for five years, the difference, again, was significant, but clinically, you're talking about a two-point difference in average symptom scores. So we're making the patients impotent. They're suffering the consequences of the hormones. We're getting better urinary function in terms of the IPSS. IPSS. We're making them impotent, which the young patients, patients don't like. So really, what's the gain? There is no oncological benefit in using short-term hormonal therapy. It's strictly just to reduce the size to make it implantable. But if you can implant the large prostate without reducing it, why would you need to use hormonal therapy at all? So that's the real question. So to get down to an answer to that, and the answer is yes, there is sometimes when you want to use hormonal therapy, and that's in those patients who come with a large prostate, you put them on alpha blockers, try and get the urinary symptoms down. If the urinary symptoms don't drop below 15 and you implant them, the risk of retention was 25%, but if you gave them hormonal therapy in addition to the alpha blockers and did shrink the prostate, their risk of retention was 5%. So there was a six-fold increase in retention in that subgroup of patients. So that remained the only group of patients I used hormonal therapy in is if I couldn't get their symptoms below 15 and they came with a large prostate, uh, we gave them three months of hormonal therapy. So that's a small group of patients. Most patients now when they come with a big prostate, 60, 70, 80, we don't give them hormones. Now, if they're in the stratosphere above 100, we do, because dealing with pubic arch interference becomes a major problem in terms of implant quality. But that's 2% of patients. That's it. So you don't need hormonal therapy in the majority of these patients anymore. All right. So this is a paper we published in uh, Brachytherapy and the implantation of patients with a prostate gland 100 cc's or greater. This is after they've been shrunk. There's still 100. How many people would implant a prostate that big? I don't see one eating. Your hand's not going up. <laughs> okay. So looking at the, the characteristics of the patients, other than the fact that uh, they had a higher PSA with bigger prostates, which is what you expect, there was no difference in Gleason score, clinical stage, initial IPSS, whether or not they had a pre-implant TUR. Uh, except for that and the use of hormonal therapy with almost all the patients who were bigger than 100 got. And the final doses were exactly the same. The percent of patients who had a BED less than 150 was 10% on each group, roughly. So there's no question you're going to run into pubic arch interference. That's a given. So how do you manage it? So I was teaching in uh, Nijmegen back in... 1999 or 2000, and the Jean de la Rosette was the urologist. So he's a fairly famous urologist now, chief of urology at AMC in Amsterdam. And the guy had a prostate flying but 25. And so we started doing the implant, and no matter where I stuck the needles anteriorly, I ran into pubic arch. So said, Jean, what the heck is wrong with this patient? Men with prostate volumes of 25 don't have pubic arch interference. Oh, he was in an accident, but he broke his hip. Oh, that's not going to affect it. So we came up with, uh, when I was there, real time in the, in the OR, I came up with this two-phase technique, which is basically you take the probe and you pull the prostate over to the contralateral pubic arch, therefore opening up, pull it this way, opening up this space. So we got all the needles in here, and then you could put any needles here because of the pubic arch was worse on this side. So we did this much of the implant. Remember, we do it in two phases, peripheral. It's all real time. And then when we finish this side, and of course, now we have the computer, so you can record what's missing, and you can reset. It's almost like doing the MRIs that we talk about today, co-registration. You can reset everything so it's back to the way it was, and then we pull the prostate over to here and opened up this side and finished the implant this way. So that's the two-phase technique. You can do it every time you have a problem with pubic arch interference. So that's not the first thing I would do. I get the legs in super dorsal orthotomy position. I put the probe in and I pull the prostate down by pushing the probe posteriorly. I angle the probe so it's like this. So I have more room above. And if that still doesn't work, which it won't work in three to five percent of the patients, 
then you have the ability to do this two-phase technique and you can do perfect implants uh, by doing this. Um, so that patient with John de la Rosette, we finished the case, we did the two, two uh, plant, two phase in technique because I was sweating. So here I am showing them what to do and I can't do it, but we got done with it. We took our x-ray afterwards. The guy hadn't, didn't have a hip fracture. He had a pelvic fracture and his pelvis was like this with plates in it. I was ready to strangle him. <laughs> That's the way that went. So this is, this is that patient I showed you before who had a prostate volume of 204. He was high, very high risk. So there are surgical clips because I did a lap node dissection on him and that was negative. And there are fiducials in the prostate because he was going to get radiation therapy afterwards. And you can see these are palladium seeds. That's why they look small. How is, as you start getting up to the pubic arch where it's pushing on the prostate, the prostate curves in because those seeds are right under the capsule. So the, and we didn't, when we put the patient back down to take the x-ray, the, of course the prostate went because it was being pushed by the pubic arch, but those seeds are right out in the margin uh, capsule of the prostate. And you can see seeds up here on in the intravesical lobe. And then we looked at the subgroup of patients with uh, very large prostates. Biochemical control was the same, whether they were bigger than 100 or less than 100. So there was no difference in that. And the, in terms of biochemical control, of course, the stage, the age, and the PSA were factors in the multivariate analysis, but the prostate volume was not. Okay, what do we do about retention? So retention series throughout the literature, this is a review paper Rich and I wrote in European Urology, you can see most of the time, it's between 5 and 10 percent. VJ Berg was the only one that ever reported really bad retention, and nobody else has reported numbers that way. But I think it's reasonable to say to your patients, it's a 5 to 7 percent risk of retention, and most of it's temporary. It'll be over within a few days. How do you manage it? So we don't like to keep catheters in a long time, but we do recognize that if they're short term, it's okay for a few days to have a catheter. But we like to get them out as soon as possible, and I've always been a fan of pushing the alpha blockers. So I'll start the patient on one, uh, tamsulosin, and then I'll increase it to two. If they're still having retention, uh, then I may add uh, another drug at night. So I'll, actually, that's way above what the, what the drug companies recommend you do. And you have to be, when you're using alpha blockers, you have to be very careful of the cardiac effects of alpha blockers. And you have to tell the patients, you know, if you're getting up at night to pee, if you take the catheter out, to sit at the side of the bed with your feet down for a few seconds so your blood pressure can stabilize. Don't just jump out of bed. And you have to watch out for the negative ionic attract, ionotrophic effect of the alpha blockers, which slows down the heart and decreases contractility by keeping an eye on pedal edema, because I've seen patients go into heart failure by pushing the alpha blockers. But if you're cautious and you watch all that stuff, uh, you'll be able to um, get away with mo using the uh, higher doses of alpha blockers and helping the patients over that critical period. This is the critical period when you see those symptoms spike for the first two weeks or to the month, and after that they start to come back down. You can use anti-inflammatory medications. Those work very well, too. And I've never really been a fan of using PDE5 inhibitors, but there may be some role uh, in that also. So what about the patients who have obstructive and irritative voiding systems? This is the worst scenario. They feel like they've got to pee all the time, and they can't. And so they, they are miserable. So again, maximize alpha blockers. Most of these patients can tolerate it during the day, but it's the nighttime that's really bad. It's getting up every 30 minutes to try and uh, urinate, and you can't urinate. So I started using low-dose diphenhydramine, especially if there's really bad nocturia. I start off with 25 milligrams. I push it to 50. I've never seen a patient go in retention from using low-dose anticholinergics at night. And, it does, and the nice thing about diphenhydramine is it helps them sleep. So they get to sleep. They get a little bit break on their urgency, and they're much happier until this all resolves. Uh, make sure you ask the patient about the history of narrow-angle glaucoma if you're going to do that. What about prolonged retention? Do you keep the catheter in? Do you put them on clean intermittent catheterization, or do you go right to a TUR? So let's so look at that data. So the TURP rates following prostate brachytherapy, they range from 0% to about 8 Eight and a half percent that we reported. Uh, Mitch Turk, our resident, reported 2.4 percent post TUR rates. The biggest issue with TURs is the risk of incontinence because, again, you're operating on tissue that's received fairly high doses of radiation, and when you over cauterize, 
it's not going to heal properly. So we, we assess as one of our residents, Steve Mock. Mike Leakman was a ju junior resident at the time, so you remember Mike was here giving talks. So Mike and Steve put this together. Um, 2,500 implants. We excluded patients who had a pre-implant TUR. 3.3% of the patients underwent the channel TERP in our database, so that's very consistent with the 2.4 we published previously. The median follow-up after implantation was 7.2 years. The median time to first post-implant TURP was 14.8 months, so we wait. The key here is you don't want to do the, if you give it an iodine implant, within one year the prostate volume will have shrunk 25 to 30 percent. So you want to use time. I've had patients on CIC for nine months, and all of a sudden nine months they started peeing. So by just telling the patient, wait, 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 and uh, supporting them emotionally, they can get through this. Uh, and there's an important reason why, which is we're going to see, is that because 20 of the 79 patients, 25.3% ended up with urinary incontinence, compared to 3% who had implant only. So the odds ratio of developing incontinence with the post-implant TUR is 10 times greater. And you're talking about that's me for the most part, although a few of the patients escaped me and got TURs other places, as I'll show you in a minute. Uh, how to do the TUR, but it's still no question it's going to be a higher incidence of incontinence if the patient has a post-implant TUR. So you want to do everything to avoid that. There's a difference, 25-3%. Now, if you think one TUR is bad, two TURs are a lot worse. So patients will have a TUR, then they'll get some irritated voiding symptoms, or they'll get some scarring in the urethra, and the inclination is, oh, I can fix that. I'll just bring you back and scrape that scar away, open up the channel. Well, guess what happens? You increase the risk of incontinence from 24% to 56%. That second TUR is really bad. So use conservative measures if the patient has a TUR, comes back and needs something done to stretch his urethra. Do it gently, do it with dilators, make a little incision, um, maybe a mini TUIP, but do not do a full TUR a second time. And there's, a, there's the actuarial curve showing how bad a second TUR is in terms of incontinence. There is a risk of incontinence based on the number of TURs, and you can see it's the risk at 10 years for somebody who had a second TUR is 77%. That's really high. And the f risk factors for, uh, and the multilinear regression, the risk factors um, in terms of the p-values, there was a little bit of risk for uh, large prostates, but the biggest risk was, again, the number of post-implant TURPs. Bottom line, CIC for a year, a minimal channel TERP. We have to remember our, our anatomy. The blood supply comes from the 5 and 7 o'clock position under the bladder neck. So when you're doing a TUR, do not resect that portion because then you're killing most of the blood supply to the superficial posterior urethra. Use minimal cautery and avoid widespread laser and tissue destruction. I've had patients come to me and say, well, my doc, my urologist home wants to do a green light laser uh, to clean up the obstruction. I say, absolutely not, because you, you have to control the depth of coagulation. Otherwise, you're setting up a scenario where there's even worse blood supply. Radiation never forgets. That means endarteritis continues for the patient's life. So what looks good today after a TUR, a couple years from now, that patient's got a fully scarred urethra and is incontinent. He may not be seeing you anymore. You may have retired. He may be going to a young urologist who loves to do robotic prostatectomy. He said, ah, you got radiation. I can fix that. I can just ablate your prostate. That's your responsibility, even though you're not practicing anymore. So you've got to make sure the patient knows. When a patient has a seat implant and he, and he goes off and has a little bit of rectal bleeding, and he goes to see the GI guy, and the GI guy doesn't really know much about brachytherapy, and the GI guy says, oh, I can biopsy that little red area, which is minimal radiation proctitis, and then he cauterizes the biopsy area. That's a recipe for disaster. So you have to inform your patients about all these things so if you're no longer taking care of them, they can protect themselves from the doctors who don't know what they're doing, unfortunately. Uh, urinary symptom flare does happen. This is written by one of our residents, Jamie Cesaretti. Um, it happens in about 30 or 40 percent of the patients. It's temporary. You treat it the same way you treat the original symptom flare right after break therapy with alpha blockers and anti-inflammatories, and it goes away in everybody. It never lasts. But 
There was a subgroup of patients that I had that would come maybe two or three years afterwards, very small number, with the worst flare symptoms I'd ever seen. And no matter what you did to them, did for them, they would not get better. So I developed a concoction of intravesical or intraurethral lidocaine, solucortuff, and sodium bicarbonate. You needed the sodium bicarbonate because the lidocaine is very acidic. I'd mix it up in a GU syringe and I would instill it per urethra, clamp the penis with a, a clamp for about 20 minutes so it wouldn't all just go into the bladder or come out the end. And I would do that on a weekly basis and almost all the patients after about six pa treatments got better with that sort of interstitial cystitis type treatment. So you might think of that in your recalcitrant patient. Uh, hematuria, so this is a paper written by Michael Lee Liebman, published in BGIU. So the 2,450 patients follow the medium of six years, and 8.9% developed gross hematuria, uh, median of a little over two years after implantation. So late uh, presenting hematuria, a little less than 10% of the patients. There is the incidence by mode, the greatest period of time was around two years where they got the gross hematuria, two years after, after implantation. Very similar to radiation proctitis. It usually comes around two years. No surprise, there's the actual freedom from development of hematuria in terms of time. Most of the patients are out by 2,000 by two, 2, days, so about six years they stop having, having the risk. Uh, what do they uh, find associated with hematuria? So let's look at the significance, really not much. External beam radiation and prostate size were the two significant factors. So this is radiation cystitis from the EBRT. Uh, that's why another reason why we don't use it anymore for intermediate risk patients. And then the issue of, always the issue of, oh, you give patients radiation therapy, they're gonna get bladder cancer or they're gonna get rectal cancer. So we published this, Michael published this two years ago in urology. Um, where we had cystoscopies done on patients, 185 men. So they were either presenting with hematuria or new onset irritative symptoms. So it's important to keep in mind that it's not, unless it's a flare and goes away in a few months, patients who present with new onset urinary symptoms could have something going on in their bladder to explain that. It's probably not the implant, so they need to be investigated. So the uh, investigation, 62% of the patients who had cystoscopy did have gross hematuria, but the rest had other reasons for it. So 40% did not have hematuria, which means they probably should be evaluated by the urologist. Now keep in mind, if you send it to the urologist, you gotta make sure the urologist is not gonna look in there and say, well, I can cut that out because it's in the way. So communication with the urologist, again, is important because you don't wanna take a situation because most of these patients had nothing wrong with them other than a minor cystitis and turn that patient with nothing wrong with them into a disaster because now he's incontinent. So we did find 18 bladder tumors and when we looked in, 0.7% uh, incidence. The median time to bladder tumor detection was three years with a range of eight months to 14 years. So those guys less than three years or so or two years probably they were not seen or not known about when they had the implant, but the ones that came much later could be related to the radiation or could not be, we just don't know. While one third of the patients were diagnosed within two years of radiation therapy, 72% were low grade, non-invasive, three patients, 16% had high grade, non-invasive, and two patients had blad bad bladder cancer. They were 11, they were 11 of the 18, so that's two out of 2,532, so that's about 1%, a little less than 1%, 0.9% had muscle invading bad tumors and needed to be treated with cystoprostatectomy. That's a relatively low incidence of bad cancer for what we've been doing. Don't leave seeds in the bladder because you'll get encrustation. Here's a patient who had a stone on his bladder because there was a seed that was left in and yeah, taking out the stones is not easy. Not because doing a cystolithopaxy is a hard operation, but you spend a lot of time trying to crack that stone up, and then you're, you're buggering up the urethra for a long period of time, and the patients are not happy after that component. So if the stone is of a certain size, you might consider doing an open cystolithopaxy and not doing it through the urethra. Much easier to do and quicker and spares the patient having the damage to the urethra. 
limit the size of the resection. So this guy I did has a small TUR, just open up the channel. This guy had a big TUR, and I'm looking in now because he's complaining, and you see all this fluffy stuff. This is uh, necrotic tissue, leave it be. Uh, Dr. Raga, when he started his series out in Seattle, he did a, a report that these, and he would see these patients and he would repeatedly resect this necrotic tissue and ate, his incontinence rate was like 88%. So we know not to leave it, not to touch it. It'll just slough off on its own and it'll heal with what it heal, heals. It does not need to be removed. What about management of incontinence? So here's that same patient I showed you on the other side. He's still got incontinence. So you looked in the urethra, it looks fine. And you pull back towards the sphincter, the sphincter is a little gaping, but it looks pretty good. That's the type of patient you can put in collagen, so that's what I did. There it is before, and I got the needle in here when putting the collagen is, and here's what it looks like afterwards. So the sphincter before the collagen, the sphincter after, he did fine, that cured his incontinence. But then you get a patient like this. Now this is the patient I spoke about this morning that was T4, Gleason 10, with a tumor invading his levoterranean muscle. So this is nine years, 10 years out, his PA is zero, and this is what it looks like. It's just patchless wide open. I'm sure we killed his sphincter when we did his treatment, but it took many years for it to present itself. So, you know, he's already 80 years old, and I didn't feel like putting a sphincter in him, so I, I tried. I tried to put the collagen in. You couldn't get anything in the sphincter because it was rock hard. You couldn't even get the needle in there, so I tried in the proximal bulb, and there you see the collagen in the proximal bulb, total waste of time. Didn't do him any good. And he didn't want any surgery, so he lived with his pad. Worst situation. Patient who has multiple resections and ends up with a stricture posterior urethra and incontinence. You can't have a worse situation than this. So the message here is avoid sending him to what I call the cowboy urologist who says, I can fix anything. I got a knife, I can cut it out. So the way you manage this, these patients, you first treat the stricture by either urethrotomy or dilatation, and then you put the patient on self-cath because they're gonna recur, their, their scar's gonna recur no matter what. And as long as he's doing self-cath and can keep the urethra open, then that will allow the urethra to rehabilitate itself, and then you can deal with the incontinence. So don't try and do this all at once. It will not work. So here's this worst-case scenario. 64-year-old man with low risk. His prostate volume was 65, no hormonal therapy. His D90 was 194 gray. He has obstructive symptoms, and, you, and this guy's got a type A personality. He's, it'll go away. Just relax. It'll go away. Doesn't want to listen to me. He goes to see the local urologist. So he told me he was going to do that in New Jersey. I said, well, tell the guy to call me. Well, these guys know better. They don't call anybody. So the guy, urologist, does an extensive TUR on the, on the patient. And four months after the TUR, he develops retention. So he comes back to see me, and he goes, I can't pee. I've got a super pubic tube in. Um, I said, well, you're going to have to stay with me, and we're going to have to figure out how to manage it. He immediately runs back to his other urologist, who does another extensive TUR on him, and tells him, you're going to be fine. So he has the other TUR. Three months later, he comes back to see me again with a super pubic tube in. I said, well, <laughs> let me take care of you now. So I look in his urethra, and you, you hit a wall. So this is the urethra just uh, at the level of the sphincter. And so we're not quite in a prostatic urethra. This is bulbar urethra. And it's cement. I can't get the scope through it. I can't get a wire through it. I can't get anything through it. So I have to take him to the OR. And all I do is just break up the stone. I put a catheter in him. I send him home, come back to the office. A few days later, take the catheter out. Comes back within a week, again in retention. And he's got the exact same thing. That tissue was so bad from all the surgery, he, he just redeveloped that complete obstruction within a week. I couldn't get a catheter in. I, cu I couldn't get the cystoscope in. I couldn't get a wire in. Back to the OR, break up the stone, and with another catheter. So that failed. A week later, he's back again. So three times, within three weeks, he regrew that stone. So said, that's it. I got to come up with some other strategy because most of these patients, you do this, you break up the stone, you put them on IC, they're fine. But this case, forget it. So I remember when I was a resident and uh, in my program at University of Maryland, my chief was doing a lot of uh, posterior urethral repairs for trauma. And he said, the safest thing you can do is you put a super, cube, put a super pubic tube in 
and you put down a 2-0 nylon wire through the suprapubic tube and you bring it out through the urethra and tie it to a catheter. That way you always have the portal to pull that catheter in. So that's what I did with this guy. The catheter is cut off now, but before it was longer. And he would just take that string, and he, because he couldn't do CIC on his own, would not go. He would pull that catheter back him to the bladder and took it out. He did this for an entire year. That was the only way we could get his uh, urethra rehabilitated. I took it all out, and his urethra never scarred down again. So you can go to the extreme to help your patients uh, if it's called for. Fortunately, that's the only time I ever had to do that in my practice, and hopefully you'll never see it. But it's an, it's an opportunity. Thank you.